Vulture Senior Editor, Jesse David Fox. Welcome to the uh, first event of Vulture Festival. Uh, you picked a good one. You picked uh, what will surely be a weird one uh, about two months ago. I go, Nick, do you think you could do a table read of Big Mouth where you do all the parts? And he's like, yeah, I think I can do it. So uh, we're going to see. Um, so what will happen is uh, we'll play a short clip. Then Nick and Andrew Goldberg, the, his co-creator of the show, will come out. They're going to read Big Mouth. Nick will be doing all the parts, as it suggests. And then we'll have some time at the end for an audience Q&A. So start thinking about that now. So let's start with a clip that shows sort of the inspiration for this panel, which was just how many voices Nick uh, can do. So roll that. That's a lot. Um, so without further ado, Nick Kroll and Andrew Goldberg. few voices I on that TV a few show. I do voices, and uh, you write most of them. So, uh, how are we? Can you hear us? Can you hear us, everybody? Uh, no. How about now? Oh. How about now? What if I just scream really loud? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's, oh, that's not, this is not what I want. I don't want to hold a mic the whole time. Uh, yeah. This is not what I want to do when I do the next 25 voices. Um, let's see here. Um, Mike Pack, where this is, guys. This is how every table read usually yeah. starts. I I uh, I turn my mic pack off because I'm wearing uh, I'm wearing a raw denim. Oh, the battery. So it's a tighter yeah. denim. Uh, how do we do? How do we go? Let's see. How's this? Can you hear me now? Okay, we're gonna do it with oh, them. Oh, there we go. Hey. Yeah. Uh, this okay. was all just a chance to do yeah. um, my newest voice, the Verizon guy. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> um, but now it's a funny story. He's the Sprint guy. Yeah. It's, it's a big coup. For yeah, sprint. it was a huge. Yeah, like you imagine Sprint was like, we did it. We locked him in. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. Andrew, what are we going to do here? What's we, the idea? Um, so, we're going to try something that we have not done before. We have never done this. Um, we call it uh, the one-man table read. Normally, our table reads, we do them uh, after we've written the show to see what's working. And there's eight or ten or twelve actors around, and we split up the parts, and everybody reads their own characters. But we pick some scenes that are mostly Nick. Right. So instead of reading a whole script, uh, which would be yeah. weird because it's like, like you don't want that guy. You don't want to hear no. me. You don't want to yeah. hear me doing Jason Manzukas. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the only Jason Manzukas mm -hmm. can do Jason Manzukas. Yeah, so, we, um, we, we found we, a lot of scenes that are just you talking to yourself. Yes, yes. <laughs> there are a number of times when we make the show where in scenes or in records, it's just me having conversations with myself. Uh, and uh, there's also just times at home where that's the case. <laughs> so uh, we thought we'd do a compilation of various scenes from the first two seasons. Uh, and uh, Andrew's going to read stage direction, and I will attempt to uh, read the part. It'll be all the peoples and the monsters. Yes. Um, should we begin? Yeah, let's begin. Yeah. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Um, so this first scene that we picked out is uh, from the season one finale, and it's featuring two of our favorite characters, and I hope yours. Uh, we are Interior Police Station. Uh, Day, the hormone monster, sits behind a desk interviewing Nick. <clears throat> so, what do you think would make you a good candidate for puberty? Uh, over Nick's answer, the hormone monster noisily eats pistachios. Well, I'm almost 13. I've kissed two girls and, of course, the old Yellowstone caldera here. <laughs> yeah, nice callback. So, I know you recently watched The Italian Stallion. Did you come? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, big time. Oh, yeah, and, and what did it feel like? Like puncturing a Capri Sun on the first try? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're done here. Give me a call in like, I don't know, two years. Oh, come on, please. What about the zit? Oh, right, yeah, let me see that. Uh, Nick leans forward and the hormone monster grabs two pistachio shells and uses them to pop Nick's zit. Ow! <laughs> Looks like your zit just came more than you ever have. <laughs> 
Now, later in that same episode, mm -hmm. um, Andrew, having watched uh, a porn video of Sylvester Stallone as a young actor, which is a real thing. This is a real thing, by the way. Yeah. If you have the opportunity, go If you watch... have the internet, if you have an internet connection anywhere. Yeah, go watch The Italian Stallion. It's the porn yeah. that Sylvester Stallone made before yeah. he became a big star. Yeah. And he was young and glorious. And he's um, great looking. Mm. He's, he's actually got a sort of a, a feminine face. Yeah, no, you can tell why somebody approached him and gave him money to be to in a porn sex video. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. They, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, so Andrew, having watched that, uh, becomes addicted to porn and sucked into the pornscape. Mm -hmm. um, and Nick and Maury go in after him. And we are interior motel room night in the pornscape. Nick and the hormone monster fall out of the TV and into the motel room from the porn. The Italian stallion himself approaches. Whoa, the Italian stallion? Hey, great. <laughs> We're looking for Andrew. Have you seen him? Pear-shaped glasses, smells like cold pasta. Oh, yeah. I thought his name was Adrian. He's the king. He's a good king. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, well, we need to talk to him. Oh, you, you don't talk to him. You listen, you know? And here, we're all his children, right? I mean, the guy's a sex god. Uh-huh. Well, do you know how to find him? Yeah, he's up the river dicks, huh? <laughs> I'll take you there, and this hairy guy too. Get over here, give me a kiss, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Uh, exterior jungle river, the boat travels up a foggy river. On the shore, they pass a sexy teacher spanking a student and a nurse having sex with a doctor. What is this place? Well, you see it is Andrew's search history. Everything you watch, you know, come to learn. They pass under a waterfall. <laughs> uh, they look up to see a bunch of mature pissers pissing on them. Ugh. Hey, great. Hey, it's Mickey, Paulie, and all the girls. <laughs> oh, this is my fault. I never should have forced Andrew to watch the Italian Stallion. Well, maybe I had something to do with it, you know, ravaging him with puberty and all. <laughs> Speaking of, when are you going to ravage me with puberty? Oh, this again. You're not ready. Then why'd you bring me along to this porn world? It's called the Pornscape. <laughs> it's a cool name. Please use it. I brought you to the porn scape because Andrew listens to you. He respects you. Hey, no offense, but we're here. Uh, they, <laughs> they pull into a small bay where the river ends. But where's Andrew? Adrian? Hey, King's in there. Uh, <laughs> the stallion points to a large red heart in the shadowy jungle. Uh, it's cracked down the middle with vines growing on its surface. Whoa. It's the heart from the Science Museum, where I skull-fucked Garrison Keillor. <laughs> Andrew and Missy almost kissed there, but that's not relevant. All you need to know is that I put my penis in Garrison Keillor's skull. <laughs> he sure did, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Um, now, at the end of season one, Nick gets Mind it. you, we wrote that before Garrison Keillor got uh, Me Too. So. No, yeah, we, 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 we didn't know at the time he deserved we, yeah. <laughs> we just yeah. we just decided on yeah. him. <laughs> we had a feeling yeah. he could use it. Yeah, yeah. Um, now at the end of, of, of season one, Nick gets his first hormone monster, Rick. And Rick is not ideal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nick, I, you know, I recently realized you're the only person we've ever had play their own hormone monster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been doing that in real life as well. Yeah. Um, now, uh, in, in the season two premiere, Nick discovers that he shares Rick with another one of our characters. Yes. He is this. Yes. He, yeah. he is. Yeah. And here's where that happens. Yeah. yeah. So we're in the doctor's office hallway. Nick trudges down the hall. Oh, what am I going to do? And past an examination room where inside is... Oh, hey, Nick! <laughs> Coach Steve? He is sitting on the exam table in a medical gown. I bet an awkward reaching fist bump, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, I still go to the pediatrician. I'm what's known in the medical community as a man baby. <laughs> Rick hobbles in. Love him all, baby still. <laughs> Wait, you're Coach Steve's hormone monster too? But he's a grown up. No bragsies, but you know, I'm special. <laughs> you yeah, special too, not very special. <laughs> oh, oh God. <laughs> you need to relax, if you know what I mean. You know? <laughs> Put a little pepper on that thought, baby. <laughs> oh my God, this is a nightmare. Yeah, but be careful. Don't twist too hard or salsa will come out. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's extra spicy. <laughs> so, 
Um, and that's how that's how we all masturbate on the show. Yeah. So we grind the pepper. It's an Indian burn style. Yeah, yeah. Um, the grinder. Yeah. Now, uh, when we started season two, yes, we knew that we wanted to do a Coach Steve loses a virginity story. Everybody was clamoring. Yes. Yeah, you guys <laughs> wanted to see him make thick in the warm. Yeah. Um, and as we were figuring that out, it occurred to us that we first needed to tell the story where Coach Steve realizes he's a virgin. Yes, that was an important step in this, the narrative structure. He's a naive gentleman yes. who doesn't understand yes. things immediately. Yes, yes. So uh, here, here is, here's the scene of Steve starting to wrap his head around this idea. It, it takes place in uh, interior storage unit slash Coach Steve's apartment. Uh, Coach Steve lies in bed with a large whistle with big red lips and a bow. Oh, I love you so much, Ms. Whistle. You're always around my neck, even all the time. <laughs> he kisses the whistle, and the whistle begins to blow loudly. Oh, wow, he's doing the whistle, too. Um, cut to Steve, jolting awake as we reveal he's been dreaming in his bed. He looks under the covers. Uh-oh, I bed wet thick again. <laughs> Why well, didn't you include Rick smoking a cigarette? Well, Russell, I'm a sister. <laughs> hey, Rick, it's not weird that I haven't, you know, done sex yet, right? I blow myself. I'm a bad hormone monster, man. <laughs> no, you're the man, Rick. No, you're the monster. <laughs> Wait, stop the clock. Is it possible that neither of us is the man? They look at each other stunned. Oh, no. <laughs> Mom, uh, yeah, mom. Take a look around, mom. Huh? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's time I sheet sneezed into a woman. <laughs> yeah, bring a little ball to your dope palm. The room starts to shake violently. Holy Pope! As it continues to shake, we cut to the outside where a forklift is lifting the entire storage unit up and starts to drive away with it. Uh oh, it smells like they're dropping us on the diaper barge again. Uh, we reveal a forklift driving toward the dock diaper barge. Oh, what do? Buster, I'm gonna smell those diapers. <laughs> Uh, now, if, <laughs> um, so a few episodes later, when it comes time uh, to make Thick and Jay's mom's warm, yeah. uh, Coach Steve is a little nervous. Yeah, it's understandable. And uh, we are with him and Rick in his uh, apartment slash storage unit uh, as he brushes his hair and Rick looks over his shoulder. You look beautiful, Steve. <laughs> I feel kind of nervous, you know? I'm just a little fuzzy on the details. No, no, you got a baby. <laughs> I think I put my peanut in her sweetie. <laughs> That's it, no, your peanut's a choo-choo chain, and her sweetie's a tunnel. <laughs> but what if I'm not good at it? What am I gonna do? <laughs> exactly, what am I gonna do? Doo-wop music begins to play, and they're suddenly wearing tuxedos. What if my peanut gets shy and nothing comes? Even that guy for his gum, he was got laid. I wanna do sex on a lady, but I'm not really sure I can. Make my pink. Can we start this again, please? <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad we didn't do a sound check for this. Can we? <laughs> can we start it with the with the sound higher so Steve can hear this? Okay. Yeah, let's start it one more time now that we're there. Okay, great. Can we start it one more time, please? I'm gonna ask you one more time. Okay, great. Thank you. What if my peanut gets shy and nothing comes out? Even that guy wore his gun. Oh, 
lot of bitters in this, man. <laughs> I know I tell you all the time, but you're the man, baby. <laughs> Uh, by the way, that song and all the songs on the show are written by a gentleman named Mark Rivers, mm -hmm. who uh, has written every song on Big Mouth. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to him. And a shout out to Joe Wenger, who yes. wrote that episode. And, and Sweetie actually is what um, yes. his family calls vaginas. Yes, <laughs> yes. Joe Wenger, so, yes. the best, the best. Um, does anybody want to hear a scene with Lola? Okay. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick, Nick's gonna do Andrew here too, and the Shame Wizard. Yes. Yes. Uh, we are at Golf Lundgren, our favorite date spot, <laughs> where we adjust to include Andrew and Lola behind a nearby vending machine. You ruined my first date, Andrew. Like, why wouldn't you just like pants me up? <laughs> I get a little shy when it comes to aggressively removing someone's clothes. Oh my God, you're such a nerd, but not in a cool way. Like when good looking people wear glasses. <laughs> you're like a nobody. Angle on the hormone monster and the shame wizard. Yes, this little oil drum gets ya. Huh, I think I can work with this. Over the following, Andrew and Lola get closer and closer as the intensity builds. You suck, Andrew, whatever your last name is. My last name is Glauberman. Glauberman? Ugh, perfect. <laughs> I know, it's a stupid name. Yeah, that's the stupidest name I've ever heard. And there's dumb letters in it, so it must suck, right? Yeah, it sucks so hard. Oh man, all this verbal abuse is making my nips hard. <laughs> <laughs> the shame wizard chuckles as Lola and Andrew stand nose to nose. Yeah, I'm a worthless, boring nobody. You're actually worse than a nobody because you're just a disgusting slimy little worm! <laughs> Come here, you big block! They start to furiously make out. The hormone monster runs around them barking, <laughs> foamy at the mouth, as the shame wizard chuckles, please. Wait, 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 say something mean about how clammy my hands are. I'm gonna wring you out like a sponge! <laughs> oh, you're a sociopath. They go back to making out. Ah, outstanding. The hormone monster howls at the sky as the shame wizard laughs and flies around him. Outstanding. Mm. Mm. Yes. Take, take a drink. As we all we all achieved our goal when we originally made the show of somehow making John Mulaney and Nick Kroll make out with each other. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, And we, also just like establish the basis of like what will become like a BDSM fetish later in Andrew's life. That's how it starts. That's how it starts. <laughs> And we don't know how it ends. Yeah. <laughs> we'll it ends with me know. wearing high heels and stomping on Andrew's balls in the writer's room. <laughs> <laughs> don't let them know our process. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so we said goodbye to Rick this year. He retired, baby. Um, yeah. But we have more plans for him, don't we? Yeah. Um, here, uh, we're, we're at Nick's house in the evening as Nick sadly bounces a basketball as Rick hobbles up. Can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> oh, uh, what's up? I got some good news and some bad news. The good news, Coach Steve did say I'm a lady. Okay. <laughs> so, what's the bad news? This is my swan song, this is my swan song, baby. I'm a towel. <laughs> what? Don't I still need you for, like, puberty and everything? Don't worry, man. I'll always be right here. In my heart? No, I'll always be right here in my body. This is me <laughs> over here. It's me, baby. <laughs> if you need me, call me. Don't call me. You know, if you need me, call me. Uh, okay, bye, Rip. <laughs> <laughs> he hobbles off into the sunset. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, later in season two. Yes. Uh, in our episode about drugs, we get to learn a little bit more about Nick Starr, mm -hmm. who is this fictitious future Nick. <laughs> yes. Who knows what that's like. I, yeah, yeah. I, we, we, I don't know where we came up with this character. Yeah. Um, and, and Nick uh, is in the alone zone, and he looks around as, as, as he walks around, and uh, he says, Hello? Is anybody here? I'm here. He turns to see Nick Starr approaching. What? Who are you? I'm you, in the future. 
wait, what's future me doing in the alone zone? You live here. What? <laughs> so come on in or shake your booty because this is your fabulous life. Nick Star spins Nick around and we're suddenly in Nick Star's apartment. It's gaudy and excessively modern. Someone with bad taste lives here. Mm. There are posters and awards for all the shows and specials he's starred in. Out the window we see the Alone Zone. Whoa, this place is baller. What do I do in the future? You're a TV personality Nick Star, of course. Whoa, and you have your own show on Netflix. It's a cartoon about how you rocked as a kid. <laughs> and do I like it? You don't mind it, although you'd rather be doing more dramatic roles. <laughs> like Operation Finale? Sure. <laughs> How come? I don't know. It's a pure ego thing. <laughs> but maybe you'll do Vulture Fest one day. <laughs> so I'm happy, right? Nick, you make more money than you could ever use, and you feel alone every single day. <laughs> So do I have like a wife or kids? No way, Nick, those things have needs. And you're allergic to that. But you'll always have the company of your best friend and robot butler, Andrew 3000. Andrew 3000, a robot that looks like Andrew, enters the room. I cleaned your bidet, Mr. Star. If I am unneeded, I will go to my jack off cubby and jack off. <laughs> See you later, simulated best friend. Correction, only friend. Goodbye, Nick. As Andrew 3000, he exits and falls on the floor, Nick, breaking. Nick, Nick, Nick. Uh, we push, push in on him, he seems terrified. <laughs> um, someone with bad taste lives here? Yeah. That was, I, I remember that was from Gil Ozeri who wrote this episode. Yes. That was from his original draft. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, we just never took it out. Yeah. <laughs> and Gil's been to my house many times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, before we finish the table read portion, we are going to do something we're calling the lightning round. Many voices all in a row, like lightning. Yes. Ready? Is that how lightning works? That's how you have many voices right in a row, like lightning. Yeah. 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 That is it. Uh, are you ready? Yes. <clears throat> Ladybug. Oh, shit. What these motherfuckers going to do? <laughs> Statue of Liberty. Baba Booey bullshit. Dolfoodle. <laughs> Gogurt burglar. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Paul Blart. Nay, nay, nay. <laughs> bad mitten. So don't think I'm a bad mitten. Then stick around and watch me fuck this bird. <laughs> <laughs> Svetlana. I want you, Andrew, but you must go to my Amazon wish list first and buy me mini fridge. <laughs> Gina's abuela. Okay. Jew Fishman. Your boys need a yarmulke. The Scientology alien. <laughs> Oh, I need it so bad. You don't know how far I come, you fucking gross planet. <laughs> Joe Walsh. John Henley doesn't call me on my birthday anymore, man. <laughs> it's a bummer, because he was my brother. And finally, the Janssen twins. Nick, you have a small penis, but your confidence is so appealing. Good. I am. I. Uh, I have throat coat. I, I drink like. I drink like pots of tea when we record uh, throughout. This. Yes, I felt like if we had one more scene, we might have. Uh, Rick lost is you. weirdly. Rick was the one I was having trouble with the most. Uh, at both. Both doing this read and also just like, you know, really connecting with the character. <laughs> Physically, even, like even, his, even more than the hormone yeah. monster, Rick is hard. Yeah, like, yeah. what's Rick's moment before, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we, if you remember, we at one time had, like, a backstory for Rick. Yes. That it, it involved uh, Coach Steve's Gary and shooting his brains yes. out in front of Coach yes. Steve. Yes. Was, and we even wrote the scene, and yeah, we were like, this I, is the saddest yeah, thing that's ever been on TV. I was like, I think this is too dark. Yeah. <laughs> is this funny yeah. or is it just awful? How do you normally record when there's, episode, when there's a scene with multiple you? Um, I mean, the way we record in general is we try to get people in the room together as much as possible, and we record the full scene, uh, and then we'll go back in and grab little pieces. And when it's me, yeah, you just, I'll, just do, yeah. I'll just do this, basically, and then, uh, and then slowly we'll, you know, we'll start picking off lines. Cool. Um, I'm going to also open up for a Q&A if you guys are ready, but uh, 
before we go, what is, what is your favorite character to do and what's your favorite character to hear? Um, I, I really honestly love doing all of them. It's really kind of doing whichever one I'm doing is, is the one that I like the most. So, uh, and I feel weirdly connected to uh, all of them um, in that I was Nick. <laughs> uh, it's weird. It's weird, but yeah. like, you know, it's like, it's fun to exercise, like, you know, to be like a true, like, hormone monster, monster, mm -hmm. uh, horn dog, and then to be like one of the, truly the dumbest. I think one of the yeah. dumbest people to ever be on television. Coach Steve. I think Coach Steve might one be of the, the dumbest, dumbest. One of the dumbest and happiest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. You know, like writing, it's so much fun. We lo we all love pitching on Hormone Monster stuff because he has such a definitive point of view. Yes, on yes. Um, the, I, you know, I'll speak for the writing stuff. I think we also have just so much affection for Lola. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and for Lola and Coach Steve in a similar way because they're both they're so lonely and they just want people to like them and yeah. love them. And they go about it in very different ways. They do. <laughs> they, do. they have different well, strategies. Well, it's fun because she yeah. sort of reveals so much of why she's doing what she's yeah. doing. And, um, you know, and I really do love her. I feel protective of her sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but it is funny to be like all these characters that are like, I don't know where I come up with the idea that these characters all feel alone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. Um, and, but in Rick, too, we had an interesting journey with him, because I think like when we first met him, we were like, oh, this, this guy's just kind of gross. And then, and once, especially once we decided that he was going to retire, he just kept getting cuter and cuter. Yeah. And well, we, also, yeah. like, we found that he was kind of groovy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. once we added, like, yeah. blah, 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 like yeah. as soon as that came into the picture, like, oh, okay. Like, oh, yeah. He's got, yeah. <laughs> he's got his thing. Yeah. To, to that point, are there smaller characters that you use more than you expected just because the voice is so funny? Uh, well, the ladybug yeah. is very useful. Uh, <laughs> well, you know? it's, it's, well, it's very useful when we're writing to have a character who, who is the first line is often like, what that person just said was crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it allows, and, and the, the beauty of the ladybug is, is you can put the ladybug anywhere, it's so small, and you just like zoom in. So <laughs> we, we have scenes that are not working, and then we'll just add in the ladybug, like, that shit's nuts! And, like, <laughs> and, and we're just like, oh good, we'll just yeah. like zoom in on that leaf, and, there, and there's the ladybug. <laughs> how do, when you come up with a, like for a Rick, how do you, what is your, what is your process of coming up with a voice? <laughs> What is my process? Um, I honestly think we were just like, Coach D should have a hormone monster, and then I think I was just yeah. like immediately like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, so many, yeah, so many of your voices are, are kind of come up in conversation. Yeah, well, the yeah. like the hormone monster yeah. started. Uh, explain the, the, the so nexus of it. When we were coming up with the show, like a really kind of key moment for us was. Um, our, our partner Mark Levin and, and, and Jen Flackett are married and they, they had a son who was right at like 12 or 13 when we were thinking of the show and Mark was talking about like just the anxiousness that he feels from and the, the overwhelming hormones and he's like is there a way to use animation and I said something like well like, like a hormone monster and he's like yes that and then I was talking to Nick later that day and I was I said the words hormone monster and Nick was just like touch yourself Andrew <laughs> and I was like, yes, like, like he immediately had his, yeah. his ethos. Yeah. <laughs> it was there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a definitely oftentimes a first instinct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's like the, you know, the Statue of Liberty, I was temping and we tried different yeah. people and then I, I'm always like, I'll temp stuff and then try, we'll, we'll bring other people in yeah. and, and, and then sometimes they'll be like, no, it's just going to be you. And, <laughs> yeah, because well, oftentimes like we'll bring other people in and well, the, the artists will have been drawing to your temp track, and at some point they'll be like, hey, Nix is funnier than the other. What we're saying is, is that I'm funnier than everybody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, not what, nah, that's, that's what, what our saying. artists are saying. Yeah, yeah, that's what the artists yeah. are saying. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll open it up. There's a question up here. The mic will come to you. And here we go. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, if you both had never uh, been successful in television or movies, what do you think you'd be doing today? Um, wow. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we met in first grade, mm -hmm. and we became, like, we were always friends, and then, like, middle school, we became best friends and, like, watched 
Wayne's World and the producers and went on vacations together. Like we really like formed each other's sensibilities of what we thought was funny. And then like went different ways and Andrew went to grad school and then started working at Family Guy and, and, I, and I went and did more performing stuff. I, I don't know, like I, didn't, I thought your question would be was like, what would have happened if we hadn't met? Oh. Uh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even like to think about yeah. that. I'm trying to think where I would have got my first hand job from. <laughs> you might have met my dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I don't. It was honestly like when I started doing comedy in college. Uh, I remember going to like a, a table read of a sketch show I did that Mike Birbiglia uh, cast me in when I was a freshman, and um, I remember walking out of that like doing it. It was basically a read like this of a bunch of sketches, and I was like, I walked out and was like, oh, this is the this is this is like this is what I want to do. This is all I want to do and I'll do anything I have to do to do this thing, and I had never found that before doing comedy. And I, I, so I, I honestly can't imagine like, what I would be doing because it's the only thing that like, I've ever wanted to do. Uh, no, no. Although, I don't know, I mean like, you know, we, I don't know, like, I, I, I don't. You could be the funny guy at the water cooler. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, my dad made me take the LSATs. Yes. And, and, and apply to law school, and I like, I had like a, like You had a, a panic attack. I had like a panic attack. I never, like, I was always good at testing, and I like, I like froze taking the LSATs, so I guess I would be a very bad lawyer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, next, next question. question. Yes, I, we can go right. Oh, go. You point, Jesse. Yeah. Well, there's one back there. Yeah. So, yeah. and they'll work forward. Yes. Yeah, that. yeah. God. Um, okay. Was, hi. Okay, this isn't nerve wracking at all. Um, <laughs> was your Lola voice inspired by your yogurt water scene? Yogurt. <laughs> uh, yeah. They I cracked mean, the code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're definitely like, I'm a big believer in like using all parts of the buffalo. Uh, <laughs> So if I've had something that I've done in the past that I liked or worked, um, I definitely w have not been afraid to uh, uh, go back to those uh, voices. So, but what's great is like, yes, like Lola definitely starts as some like what Liz from Publicity sounded like. Uh, thank you. Um, but then she becomes her own character uh, very much to herself. Uh, Coach Steve um, started, there were similarities to uh, where Ref Jeff was on, on Kroll Show. Um, but then again, everything evolves and becomes its own thing. And now, like we just rewatched the pencil test. Yeah, and Coach Steve sounds very, we, we made like a, when we sold the show, like a little two minute black and white piece of animation. And we were, um, one, of, one of our assistants was watching it, she'd never seen it, and she was like, oh my god, Coach Steve sounds so different. Yeah, yeah. And he's not as dumb and cheerful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's dumb, but he's not as, as dumb. dumb. <laughs> he was already he's like, he's already stupid. He wasn't like clinically stupid. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but uh, yes, I think that hopefully answers your question. Uh, yeah, I see you. You can just, and I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Uh, I got it right here. Oh. oh. oh wow. <laughs> You can, see your eyes you can take it if you want, or you can yeah. just repeat it, and I'll just say it. Uh, oh, yeah. I was oh, going to you. We'll, we'll go to you next, so oh, go yeah. ahead, sir. Two questions, real quick. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. So One is, um, have you ever thought of doing a long-format version of the show, like maybe a special movie for Netflix or something? Um, interesting. Uh, kind of a special, like they go to camp or something. Like sure. the Charlie Brown used to do, like a kind of a perverted Charlie Brown. We were going to do special. just an episode of Peanuts. <laughs> uh, I will say this is separate, off topic, but th that's good, that's a good idea. Um, is uh, <laughs> is that when I was on the hit show Cavemen, <laughs> we were we were the ratings were not, uh, if you can uh, believe it. <laughs> By the way, I still stand by, not a bad show, funny show. Uh, but when we were shooting Cavemen, we, we were preempted one week. The, it was the Tuesday, we were airing on Tuesday, Thanksgiving was on Thursday. We were preempted for the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special on Tuesday, <laughs> which we were like, fair enough, it's Thanksgiving, it's Charlie Brown, got it. Uh, next week, I was like, all right, let's see what Cavemen's got this week. <laughs> and we were preempted uh, for the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special again. <laughs> 
Uh, it was leftovers. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, sleepy time. And, oh, and the, the other part yeah, was sorry. really quick was just about, have you ever been approached to offer this as a curriculum for maybe middle school uh, sex ed classes or something? Because it's, it's, it's so great. I would let my child watch it for sure. Uh, good. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's, Gratifying when people are like, this is the best. It's gratifying and sad when people say this is yes. better than the sex ed we're learning in school. Yeah. I mean, we work with, um, there, there are a handful of sex ed teachers and writers that we do talk to yeah. throughout the year and, you know, try to whether, you know, like we're, we're not educational, we're entertainment, but we do try to get a sense of like what, what kids are interested in, what issues they're having. Yeah, so like we, yeah, we, we meet with, this will be Pe Peggy Ornstein who wrote this book, Girls and Sex, which is a terrific mm -hmm. book. Uh, we've chatted with her. She put us on to a uh, woman, Shafia Zaloom, who's a sex ed edu uh, educator in, in Northern California, and we like Skyped with all of her students. Um, another, this woman, Dr. Karen Natterson, who we talked to, wrote the American Girls series, and it writes a lot about uh, adolescence and puberty. Uh, so we, we, we take all that stuff pretty seriously and, and what we find is like the more research we do and the more we talk to actual educators we learn and it inspires interesting stories. Um, like the Planned Parenthood episode we met with, um, uh, thank you. Uh, we met with Sue Dunlap, that all came around because Sue Dunlap who is the CEO of Planned Parenthood in Los Angeles uh, brought us uh, uh, to the to a Planned Parenthood, and we chatted with her and found out about like Blue Waffle, um, <laughs> which is a it's thing, not real. Which is not real. Yeah. It's an STD. But we learned, for example, yeah. that tons of kids think there is this STD called Blue Waffle. One of our writers, who's 23, was relieved to hear that Blue Waffle. Yes, was yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so we take all that stuff seriously. I mean, like we're first and foremost a comedy show. Uh, we are aware of what messages. Uh, or things that are coming out of that for kids, but like our hope is that there's actual sex education going on. Um, <laughs> if any of you have kids or or uh, no kids, uh, <laughs> there's a, a, a website called amaze.org, which is like sort of, it's like animation, sex education stuff, but it's geared to specifically for kids uh, that I recommend if people want to like show their kids stuff. But I also think, like we have a lot of people where they're, who are watching the show and their kids are watching the show. They might not be sitting in a room together watching the show, which can be awkward, but we found that um, people watch their show and their kids watch the show and then it gives them a platform to talk about some of this stuff, which, uh, and I think it also gives kids who are the age of the kids in the show, the feeling that they're not like so alone, uh, which I think is the, kind of the most crushing part about puberty is that feeling that you are alone that nobody else knows what you're going through and I think that's where like the shame wizard uh, really takes hold is the we we also shame wizard comes from Brene Brown Brene Brown yeah. who has an amazing yeah. TED talk about shame and guilt uh, and so we took a lot of what she how she talked about shame and, and used it yeah. and the idea being that the cure for Shame and feeling you're alone is talking to each other. And, yes. And not keeping sex a secret. And that's right? what we were trying to do in that uh, episode of The World Without Shame in the second half of the school sleepover. It was when the kids start talking to each other about what they feel ashamed of that the shame wizard is kind of vanquished. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't going to bring it up, but first point, my father loves cavemen, and I feel compelled to tell you that. <laughs> So you got one. He's a cavey. Yeah, nice. <laughs> a a cavehead? Yeah, yeah, I like them all. <laughs> but to that point about kind of going into more about Planned Parenthood and going into like educating kids, one of the things I loved about last season was that I could tell all of my guy friends that I know since middle school, you have to watch this show. And this <laughs> season I got to tell all my girlfriends yeah. um, who I'd known since middle school, you have to watch this show. So I'm wondering what went into that shift to go into more of the girls' stories? Because I thought it was... It was really interesting the way that that started to happen. You started to learn more about them and where their struggles were and that they got that kind of same consideration that a lot of the boys got in the first season. Yeah. Back for that question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when we first started out, it was, you know, like, because it's Andrew and Nick, we were very focused on kind of telling the story of that friendship. But then in, in season one, even, when we, when we told the story of Jesse getting her first period or... Girls Are Horny too, or the head push, we found that 
when we did focus on our female characters, we ended up with great episodes. Yeah, I think it was, um, I think our intention always was to tell a variety, and our, continues to be to tell a variety, a spectrum of stories. Uh, the way into the show was, was us as these boys. Um, but I think agreeing it was like, we, we, we didn't, like when we wrote the Jesse Gets Her Period at the Statue of Liberty, which is based on our friend, our dear friend Liz, who Jesse is, is somewhat inspired by, when we told her about the show, she was like, oh, I got my period for the first time at the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And the actual, and, and Jesse Klein, who plays Jesse, got her period for the first time at her, her grandma's house on Yom Kippur. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, but so then we were like, oh, well, Jesse gets her period, and we were all of a sudden like, oh, Jesse needs a hormone monstrous. And then we were like, well, who should we use for that? We got that no talent Maya Rudolph. <laughs> So I think that was important that all of a sudden we were all of a sudden like, oh, the hormone monstrous Maya Rudolph is probably like the best uh, performance on television this year. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and I, so I think we were, were like, we realized that there was a lot more stories to tell in that space. And, and, and like, like, in a way like, oh, we've seen a lot of boys going through puberty. We have not seen in pop culture uh, what it's like for girls, and so it, it honestly like was just like, ooh, we're gonna we get to do stuff that people haven't really done yet, and we realize. And I think specifically, there's also the, the episode of in season two of like, what is it about boobs? Where the girls go to the Korean spa, um, and that really came from Jen Flackett, who mm -hmm. went to the Korean spa with her daughter and was just like, just blown away by all these women, all the different shapes of women, and how comfortable all those women were in there and that you could show girls and women be naked and not have it sexualized in any way. And I think we were really interested, and like Jen and Kelly Galuska, who wrote that episode, were really interested in, in getting in there and starting to dig into that kind of stuff. And um, so I think, I really, part, it's, so much of it is due to Jen Flackett, who's one of our mm -hmm. co-creators, who is like such a strong voice in the room and, and guides so much of that stuff. So. Well, yeah. And, it, and, it, and like you said, it, it, ha it it's also comes from just being in the writer's room with Jen and Kelly and Emily Altman, who's another writer who's been with us in season one. And, but also like hearing from Jesse and from Maya and from Jenny about their experiences, we're always bringing them in. And it's, you know, it's unusual to know like ha where a half a dozen of your friends had got their first period. Yeah. <laughs> but it is that kind of room where we share all these personal things and we, we hear from boys, people who are boys, people who are girls, and start to really, start to really consciously try to yeah, tell Yeah, and sides. like glowworms kept coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like the yeah. corner of couches. Yes, the, yeah. Well, it's, and it's that, that nice moment too of where like two people in the writer's room are like, I humped my couch too. Yeah. I thought it was weird. I didn't know it was part of being a 12 year old girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we did have a friend who fucked his pillow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir, right there, and then we'll go back to you, Ryan. Yes. Yeah, so I love the amount of research that goes into every character, every aspect. That's incredible. But how does that research influence, like, where the voices come from? Because I've been able to do, like, I can do that voice, but like, I can do that. But, like, when it's come to emulating the other voices, I'm having difficulty. Not that I'm trying to steal your job, but, like, <laughs> but I'm just so curious on how, like, your research influences where it starts vocally. Um... It, honestly, so much of it is first instinct. Mm -hmm. It's so much like what comes out. Um, and then, I, I don't, right? I mean, yeah, I, for, it, for you especially, it seems to be first instinct. Like, there's a couple, like, like I remember very vividly when Maya first recorded The Hormone Monstrous, and it came very quickly to her, but it was like, it's a conversation usually. It's like somebody will do something, and then I think it was, I think it was Jesse who brought up some clip that she had seen of Diana Ross. Mm -hmm. um, shouting at people because they were they were leaving her concert because it was raining yeah. outside, and she was like, "Come on, people! It's just a little rain." Yeah. And like, <laughs> and when that and when, we, when that was mentioned to Maya, that really kind of like yeah. Let her, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's like um, it's it's somewhat of a discovery. I have the advantage because I'm in the writers' room, so I can sort of be building, and then sometimes we'll pitch people out, you know, when we bring them in or like. 
And but you know, for the most part, we're just writing to people's voices that mm -hmm. we know and like. Oftentimes, um, so it's like it's like, well, who do you want to, to play my pubes? <laughs> and it's like, well, I think it would be funny if it was Craig Robinson and Jack McBrayer. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think like, but it's really, on, it, everybody's process is different. Uh, for me, it's first instinct, and then it's also like seeing what's out in this, the spectrum of stuff that, I've already, that I'm already doing and being like, what, what haven't we heard? What needs to be filled in? Uh, is, well, I guess, like the right. Italian Stallion, I feel like, was just because we were, we had already come up with this idea that they watched this porn, and then you just started doing Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, and I kind of love that yeah. Sylvester Stallone voice, yeah. and so I, I, I feel like I reverse engineered it to get... <laughs> Which was to get, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, so you, you work with what you yeah. got. Yes, right behind you, yes, in the Target shirt, or the bullseye. bullseye. <laughs> I'm not I, saying you bought your shirt at Target, and even if you did, that's great. It's a wonderful... I, I will take it as a compliment. Yeah. So for each of you, I'm wondering, what is your the episode that you feel the most proud of when you think about the show overall, and why do you feel the most proud of that episode? Um, God, that's... An, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Is it a Max Fun shirt? <laughs> Nice, British Air Force. Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for your strength. Uh, I mean, I'm... Uh, I mean, I, I, we really fall, like, we spend so much time with every episode. There are so many stages to it. And just quickly, like, I do a lot of these voices, but, like, Andrew, um, like, every lunch, when we break for lunch, like, I go and, like, take a nap like a little diva bullshit actor. <laughs> And Andrew spends all lunch going through and looking at every character design, every set design, every piece of every piece of animation, every sound lock, every color mix, every piece of the show like runs through Andrew, Mark, and Jen. But Andrew oversees every moment and frame of the show from story character design through storyboard, through animatic, through colors, through and 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 does every moment of the show in a way that like. People don't realize how much work goes into making animation, specifically how much work Andrew does to make the show look and feel as good as it does. Um, so it's very kind of you. It's very true. Yeah. Um, it, it would all be pointless if you weren't so funny. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's so anyway. So I'll just say that about it. But I, so, uh, but I, I mean, I I don't know, man. I like. Uh, Planned Parenthood felt very special to me yeah. just because it's it's getting into some real shit. Um, and exciting to kind of break form and yeah. show that we can do that. And, and like and the, the weirdly like the, the, the scene about Andrew's mom getting an abortion set to uh, Groove is in the Heart uh, <laughs> makes me cry every time yeah. I watch it. Um, My favorite episode from season one is Girls Are Horny too. Yeah. Because that was like such like an obvious and unfortunately radical idea and I yeah. and, and I liked it as just I think when, sometimes when we do our, our best episodes it's taking something that happens whether it's somebody getting boobs or this realization that girls are horny too and kind of seeing everybody's different point of view on the same thing and yeah. how boys react to it and how girls react yeah, to it. Yeah, I, I mean, season... T I, I also like the head push episode in season mm -hmm. one, which is like, you know, it was a, it, we wrote it before all, all the Me Too and Time's Up stuff came out, but it's... Back when guys were nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's all about consent, and it was like, the conversation that all the kids were having was like, I think, a pretty honest, real conversation, and then we had like the Seinfeld cutaway as like an out yeah. to like... Like, like, <laughs> like, ease up a little bit on me. Like, did that guy just rape that girl? Like, so, um, I think we, like, anyway, so I liked, and then, I don't know, I thought all the Jesse stuff with their parents going through divorce, I found, like, really mm -hmm. interesting and fucking dark and moving. And, like, Jessica Chaffin and Seth Morris voice uh, Jesse's mother and father. And they're both like, this is the most serious acting I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, and Jesse Klein, who, who is such an amazing writer and, and, and storyteller and comedian, and, but has not done a ton of like, on-screen acting, I think it gives such a like, emotional mm -hmm. performance. And like, her stuff with the, the Depression Kitty, uh, I found like Gene Smart, who voices the Depression Kitty, like, I'm really proud of that idea of 
getting into like what depression is and, and manifesting that, uh, I, I think is pretty cool. Uh, time for about two more. Let's do that. And then you. Hi. Obviously, with animation, you guys can probably get away with a lot more than you can in live action. How often, when you're writing, do you find yourselves going, uh, can we do this? Yeah. <laughs> well, we were trying to get Garrison Keillor. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a moment after that in that Garrison yeah. Keillor episode where we had, <laughs> it was the only note Netflix gave us on season one, <laughs> which was like, after the Garrison Keillor, like, Coach uh, Rick is like, goes like, suck my sick little dick. <laughs> Which is, for no subtitles, suck my sick little dick. And you see him pull a thermometer out of his little dick. Yeah, it's like, boom, boom, and there was like the a hole. spurt of yeah. blood came out. And we were like, maybe that. And Netflix was like, how'd you guys feel about not? <laughs> And we had just had like a half hour argument where half the room was like, no, it's funny. And half the room were like, no, it's yeah. just gross. And we let them be the deciding. Yeah, role. and I was yeah. like, maybe, maybe we can let this one yeah. go. We also found Jen Flackett's line with the Garrison Killer thing. Because part of the, there was, there was a pitch that in, in that crazy gym scene that, that part of a pan would be Garrison Keillor holding his own severed head <laughs> that was licking his own butt. Yeah. And we even had a drawing for it, and that was where she was like, that no, was, no, that I was can't. Can. <laughs> yeah. uh, in back, yes, right there, you, yes. Oh, no, yeah, well, sure. <laughs> I won. Um, so two per question. One is maybe Googleable. Um, is there gonna be a season three? And if so, any spoilers? Spoiler alert. Uh, yeah. Is there going to be a season three? Uh, what do you guys think? Should we do season three? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess fortunately Netflix agrees. So we yes. agree. We are we are doing season three of Big Mouth. Everybody, this is the official. 2019. 2019. So, any spoilers? No. No. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, you. By the way, when you say Googleable, it sounded a little like Liz. <laughs> oh, Google, oh, oh. <laughs> one more, one more question. Yes, yes, yeah. So it's really different from anything else I've ever seen. How did you make the decision to go with that animation style, and who does it? Um, the decision, the, the the original drawings were uh, Joe Vox, who's a very talented artist. He's one of the directors at Family Guy, which is where I worked before. Uh, he drew those first drawings, um, and I think what was so cool immediately to us was uh, the the eyes are so much different than most animation. They're much more detailed, which I think helps with a lot of the emotions yeah. of it. Um, and Anthony Leoy is our supervising director, who you know when Nick says I work nonstop on the show, Anthony really, you know, if if you like the way it looks, it's it's Anthony and it's Otto Tang, who's our art director. Um, who not and, only does all the, you know, helps with it, but like every time you see like a Magritte painting in the background, yeah. it's like that's auto tech. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, we have an insane, insanely mm -hmm. talented group of, of directors and yeah. storyboard artists and mm -hmm. animators, and uh, we do it at Titmouse mm -hmm. uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, but yeah, I think. Yeah, in terms of the look, I think one of the things we knew early on was we wanted to do hand drawn animation just because it seems to be for, for comedy. The, the best way to get kind of nuanced acting. And we knew that we were gonna have these amazing voice actors and we wanted to make sure that the artwork kind of supported their performances. Yeah. yeah. We have time for one Yeah, more? I guess we have time for one yeah. more. Uh, yes, up, over here. Over here. Oh. Uh. <laughs> How, uh, I, I have almost no formal training. Uh, <laughs> I took, you know, I've just been doing, I've just been doing, like, yeah. I made my living in New York doing, like, radio commercials when I first moved there, doing voiceover stuff. Since um, we were children, we did, we would do we, voices back and forth. Yeah. Like, somewhere we have to find it, there's, like, <laughs> A, a video of us in my room interviewing each other, and you you did Roy Cohn. Yeah, I was, as, a, as a 
four or fifteen year old doing Roy yeah. Cobb. Um, <laughs> have you ever seen Angels in America? <laughs> <laughs> it's the part that in the movie Al Pacino plays. It's not a normal thing for a fourteen year old boy <laughs> to decide to delve into. It's good to have in your repertoire. Yes. Um, and as far as uh, uh, the hormone how do you monster talk like goes, Maury? it's I, I don't I don't know how to describe it. Eh. It's the back of the throat. It's the. Uh, uh, let's all try it, guys. Let's all try it together. Let's all try to go. Let's all, on the count of three, we'll all say, touch yourself, Andrew, okay? <laughs> One, two, three. Touch yourself, Andrew. <laughs>